nobody understands the pain you go through. And until it's actually changed the law of this land, we're never going to get the justice that we want. Hundreds of mourners paid their respects to the father of three, Gary Newlove, who suffered head injuries when he confronted the youth outside his home in Cheshire. In August 2007, Britain was rocked by the news of a man who'd been brutally murdered by a gang of drunken youths outside his own home. Just a, a normal guy who was in his house, just standing up for himself, standing up for his family, and paying the ultimate price for that. <laughs> Gary Newlove had confronted the yobs who'd been vandalising his wife's car. They turned on him and his three young daughters witnessed their father being viciously attacked. So this was 10 o'clock on a summer's night. Oh, call an ambulance! And it was all over within minutes in his life. The outrage at the actions of the drunken teenagers caused the entire nation to confront the alcohol-fueled gang culture plaguing the streets. It was a crime that shook Britain. this August, I turned my husband's life support machine off. <laughs> my daughters witnessed their father being kicked in the head 14 times. As he fell to his knees, they punched and kicked him in the head. This happened in two minutes. Gary lost his life. My daughters lost their father and I lost a husband. This assault is particularly vicious and sickening because he posed no threat to them at all. Um, and tragically, he was doing what any other member of the public is most likely to do. Warrington, in the northwest of England, lies halfway between Manchester and Liverpool. Like most towns across Britain, it has its fair share of problems, but its population of almost 200,000 live a relatively peaceful life. It was a really nice place to live. It's a little old village, actually. Fernhead and Padgate are very old villages, so they, they still got that quaint look about them. What I really liked more and importantly was the old-fashioned neighbours who had time to say hello. Fernhead, the area where Mr Newlove lived, and Padgate, the wider area that that's a part of, neither of those are particularly bad areas. They're not areas that are known as the worst crime hotspots in Warrington. They're not the sort of place where necessarily you'd expect a crime like this to happen. It's not an area that I think you'd say was plagued by crime. I'd say it's typified as a working class area, a close knit community. People who take stock in, in, in good values and, and you know doing things the right way and, and trying to make a living and bring up their children. But it is an area that perhaps people felt the police weren't giving enough attention to their complaints. Gary Newlove lived with his wife Helen and their three daughters Zoe, Danielle and Amy in Station Road North, a quiet residential street with a subway at one end. It's a um, nice sort of road, Station Road North. Um, at the bottom there is the subway, which is where all the problems came from, where the youths used to hang about. It was certainly an area that Helen told me she was plagued with youths over a number of years. It wasn't something that just happened on that particular night. When we moved into Fernhead, it was a case of we looked at the subway and you had these perceptions, because I always say you'd never judge a book by its cover. And I'd, I'd have grown up around there, so I knew it was pretty safe and not a problem. But then we realised after, I think we must have been there 12 months, 18 months, we noticed that there was more groups of young people walking through. The area was getting littered with alcohol, um, you know, cans of lager. So, you know, when you look at it all together, you could see it evolve into something that we really wanted to stop. I wouldn't say it was one of the worst areas in the country, but certainly there are a number of issues in Warrington. A lot of them related to young people that are abusing alcohol and causing trouble, that getting into fights both in the town centre and in some of the, you know, communities across the town. It's not that you're scared or you feel threatened by the, what's going on in where you live. It just doesn't make you feel relaxed at weekends. 
that did make us look at things and it did make us think, do we need to, to live here? The Nula family were just your typical, normal, hard-working, northern family. Mr Newlove had a job as a sales director. Uh, Helen looked after their three uh, young girls who, who were all at college or at school. We were close. We did everything together. We went to the hairdressers, to the dentist, to the doctors. I mean, I was a wuss with the dentist, so Gary always had to take me to the dentist. He never liked staying away from home when his job made him do that. Um, so he was really a family man and liked to, to you know, spend time with the girls. So what are we doing today? He had a fantastic sense of humour. When I met him, I never laughed so much in all my life. He was really a bubbly person and um, absolutely worshipped the ground that the girls walked on. Tragically, the events of August 2007 were not the first time the New Love family had faced heartache. At 32, Gary was diagnosed with stomach cancer and he was in theatre for five hours, so I was absolutely petrified and he was in intensive care for three days, so he suffered, you know, they took the whole stomach and he took his spleen as well, so he was like a little old man. And he was my hero then to get through that. He was very, very, you know, very, very positive. Gary successfully won his battle against cancer, with doctors describing his recovery as miraculous. Life slowly returned to normal for the new loves, but in the months prior to the attack, Gary began to notice a marked increase in the antisocial behavior that was plaguing their area. He had concerns because at times he'd be up and down the hallway looking through the door on a Friday night to see who was walking past the cars, um, if he could hear any noises. And I used to say, you know, it's no good doing this, you need to be relaxing, we need to look at moving. But it was just a case of you were fed up of going outside, looking at your garden, you were fed up of going and checking on your car. And one incident where it's a straight road and all your cars have been damaged by a group of you through the night. It makes you very disheartened and say, well, you know, what is it? And we knew that if we phoned the police, it's a case of a crime record and that's it. it was, they would never come out for criminal damage. As their concerns grew, it also seemed to local residents that the drunken teenagers causing havoc in the area, fueled by cheap super strength alcohol, were getting more aggressive. In the weeks prior to the murder, there'd been a number of incidents, some of which we were aware of as a newspaper, some of which the police were aware of. There was an incident some 10 days before in which members of the gang attacked another man, came outside of his house to defend his house. In all honesty, the signs were there, the warning signs were there. After putting up with months of abuse, intimidation and vandalism, local residents began meeting together with police to address the problems in the area. Eric, my uh, neighbour across the road, and uh, myself used to go. What really summed it up was when we were sat in one meeting and we had the police officers there, we had the fire service there, and we had kids banging on the windows who were causing lots of problems, and the police were sat there. And then we had a neighbour who complained that his fence was always set on fire. And as he said that, his fence had been set on fire. So then we had the fire. And we just looked and thought, what is this going to help, you know? So it was on an occasion when I walked back home with Eric and I said, you know, nothing will change until somebody's murdered here. Little did I know that a few months later that would be Gary. Gary Newlove lived in the Fernhead area of Warrington with his wife and three young daughters. A devoted family man, he was becoming increasingly concerned that the alcohol-fueled gangs roaming the streets where he lived were becoming more dangerous. One group of teenagers in particular were notorious in the area, and on the day of the attack, they were intent on getting drunk and causing havoc. On the day of the murder, the gang gathered in a local park. They drank some cans of lager. Um, they decided from then on to go to an off-license to buy more alcohol, where they bought more cans of lager, where they bought bottles of cider. And, and on the night of the attack, they had all consumed an incredible amount of alcohol. If I remember rightly, one of the gang had had something like 10 cans of lager and a three litre bottle of cider. He'd had the best part of that to himself. These were young men who, who were, were very drunk. And then they basically embarked on a spree of violence around that area, heading from park to park, 
heading off down alleyways and, and shortcuts between parks, little paths and getaways that they knew very well from, from hanging out in the area. During the afternoon, the gang was stopped by a police community support officer in a local park who confiscated their alcohol. In a typical lack of respect for the law, the gang simply bought more beer and cider and continued prowling the area looking for trouble. On a park, on one park, they spotted two teenagers who they approached, and one of the gang punched one of the teenagers who, who fled. Unfortunately, didn't report this to the police. They continued on to a nearby bus stop where they, they saw three teenagers sat at the bus stop, including a young disabled boy. He shouted and swore at the, at the children, chased them down the road, and unfortunately, the, the young disabled boy got separated from the group. They caught up with him, and when they caught up with him, they punched him, kicked him to the ground. <laughs> They then headed to the main park in the area where they sat drinking and smoking for several more hours before heading to a, a local pub where a, a large gang of youths had gathered outside on benches just down from Station Road North, where Mr Newlove lived. Friday night, the, the, the attack happened on Gary. It was a very normal night. It was just a Friday night, really, ready settling down for the weekend. I'd gone to go to bed early because I didn't feel very well. And Gary came up to see if I was OK, uh, how was I feeling, I was fine. And he, he gave me a cuddle and I told him I loved him and he told me he loved me. You two need to get a room. Amy said, oh, you need to get a room like kids do. Yeah. And then Gary just went downstairs. Zoe was working and Danielle and Amy, they were reading in the rooms. As the gang wandered up Station Road North, one member struck out a vehicle that was parked in, in a driveway, uh, breaking a light. Um, which I believe attracted the attention of some of the neighbours. They carried walking up the street just a couple of doors further down when one of the gang um, decided to kick out at Mr Newlove's car. I heard the glass as, as Amy heard glass smashing and I just presumed here we go again, it's a Friday night. Something's going on outside. Oh, I can get it up to sort it out. So I said, I'll get Dad to go and have a look. Shouted down the stairs to Gary, could he just go and check if everything's OK? And I remember the last thing of him looking at me was just turning and saying, yeah, not a problem, I'll just go and check. And that's the last I spoke to Gary. And Mr Newlove, who was inside in his house, saw the gang out in the street and decided to, to come out and have a stern word with them and, and, and send them on their way. <laughs> Gary had gone out and asked who had damaged my wife's car, and they just laughed. As he came out and shouted at the gang, they hurled insults at him and, and, and goaded him. You just kicked the car. It was him, I just told you. Man. And circling him. It was at that point that Adam Swellings came up from behind Mr Newlove and struck him in the face. <laughs> My daughters witness every bit of that, and the next thing is that because he didn't go down, <laughs> Gary was kneed in the back, and he did go down this time. And as he fell to his knees, they punched and kicked him in the head. And my daughters then said they were trying to push them off. Amy pushed one of them. She nearly got punched. Zoe then ran to grab one of them and uh, they were punching, chopping at a hand. And one of the gang kicked Mr Newlove so hard that his trainer came off. His trainer was actually found under Mr Newlove's body. In the immediate aftermath of the attack, the gang fled the scene and headed to a, a nearby chip shop. For you or I to think of, of, of killing somebody and then wandering off to a chip shop for dinner is, is incomprehensible. This is what they did for fun. This, is, this was a good Friday night for them, was to, to get drunk, to, to smoke drugs, and, and to go out and, and look for violence and look for trouble and get their thrills from doing that. Back at the scene of the attack, and with incredible bravery, 
Amy frantically ran back to the house to tell her mum what had happened. The next thing was Amy came running, screaming to call for an ambulance. She said, Dad's on the ground. And it was only then that sunk in. Oh, my God. Then Amy collapsed on the ground. You need to go outside. My next door neighbour was stood over her and said, Don't worry, I'll see if she's okay, but you really need to go outside. It was like I was stuck in a, a world, to be honest. I could see Gary was lying on the ground, but couldn't get to him. When I got there, Zoe just wouldn't let me near her dad. She said, don't keep looking at Dad, look elsewhere. And the next thing, I just screamed. And that's when my world really collapsed that night. The next thing I remember is an ambulance was turning up. And when I went to step into the ambulance, they kind of told me to step down because Gary had gone again and they had to work on him. I just ended up sitting on the curbside, feeling physically sick, didn't know what to do, was phoning family members, shouting at them, you know, he's been attached, you need to get here. So we went to the hospital and when I got there and I had to wait in A&E and then when they came out and said we want to take you into the family room, daft again as it is, I just knew what happened in family rooms and I'm saying to them I know what happens in casualty, you know, I've seen how like, you're not taking me in this family room and eventually they coaxed me in and that's when the doctor came to see me and said Gary is very, very poorly and he was in a coma. And I asked, was it a medically induced coma? And they said, no, he's, um, he's one of his pupils had dilated and was bleeding. And I asked, could I go and see him? And he was that poorly that they said, we can only give you seconds to see him. And it's horrible, you see the neck collar, but his head was so swollen, it made me feel physically sick. And I still say to this day that there was a footprint on his forehead that was a footprint of a trainer. Gary Newlove had suffered a severe brain hemorrhage as a result of a violent kick to the back of his head. Doctors were running out of options and prepared Helen for the worst. I begged him to fight this. He'd fought cancer. I said, don't be a wuss, you can fight this. Despite his wife's pleas, it was a fight that Gary was losing. There was nothing more she could do, so doctors advised Helen to return home and try to rest while they cared for her husband. So I decided to go back home and uh, hope, hopefully it would still be there when I get back. And when I went home, I told the girls that Dad was, you know, poorly, but didn't really let on how poorly he was. I said, he's, he's asleep and I've come home, but I'm going to go back to them. It was a question then of, do I want to bring the children to see their dad? When she heard the news, Gary's 12-year-old daughter, Amy, wrote her dad a letter, pleading with him to get better. I know you can fight this, as you are a strong, loving man, who I know loves me no matter what. I will stick by you while you're in hospital, and I will take care of Mummy. I can't get across to you how much I will miss you, and I don't know what I would do without you. And I really didn't know what to do. I was scared for them. I was scared not to, to give them that choice but I decided that I didn't want them to remember the dad on our dirty floor. I wanted them to, to come and have a bit of closure um, so they could hug the dad, really. They couldn't understand why Gary couldn't open his eyes, and I just said I had to say he was under medication, so he was sleeping to make his body better. And I said, what he needs is lots of hugs and kisses. Um, little did they know that would be the last time they would actually be able to touch the dad. Um, so it's heartbreaking to see what they saw, the kicking and the punching, and then having to hug him. Um, I don't know how you comprehend the two of them, to be honest. So they went home on the morning, and the results came back to say there was nothing that Gary's brain, brain dead, 
Um, and that was my decision then to turn off the machine. I went in to say goodbye. Please forgive me. I think as a human being, you always think they may be alive. And then it was time to go around the bed. And I just lay on top of Gary. And um, we all lie on our loved one's chest and you hear them breathe. And we don't realise how precious it is to hear somebody breathe. Because they ask you, are you ready for that switch to be turned off? And um, it's horrible because it's just instant. <laughs> the next procedure is that he's taken away. I do feel guilty. I never had that closure. I never had that time to hug him, to kiss him, without a machine around him, that tubes around him. So I miss that kind of closure, really. When I went back to tell the children what had happened to their dad, that was the most heartbreaking thing. When I told them that dad had died, and the other two just absolutely burst into tears. They'd lost their dad. Police immediately got to work, identifying Gary Newlove's killers hidden within the group of alcohol-fueled yobs that filled the street that night. Painstaking detective work, along with several eyewitnesses, identified key members of the gang, and within hours, most were in custody. It was now up to the officers to work out if their prisoners were suspects or simply eyewitnesses. We had a number of eyewitnesses who gave an account of four or five youths attacking Mr Newlove. We also had a number of eyewitnesses who said that one particular individual was involved. So what I decided to do was to get a, a map drawn of the street and draw on where Mr Newlove was. And then we got each individual who was involved to record on their individual map where individuals were stood at the time of the attack. And what was consistent in that was when we mapped them all, overlaid them all, was the fact that there were five youths stood around Mr Newlove. Of these five, three names began to emerge. Three names of youths high on drink and drugs that had been terrorising the neighbourhood for weeks. Adam Swellings, aged 18. Stephen Sorton, who was 16. And Jordan Cunliffe, aged just 15 at the time of the attack. Gary Newlove was attacked in the street outside his own home by a gang of drunken yobs. In a short but violent assault, he had suffered severe brain damage and had died later in hospital. Police wasted no time in rounding up the prime suspects who witnesses had placed at the scene of the crime. They included Adam Swellings, Stephen Sorton and Jordan Cunliffe. A couple of members of the gang were stopped by two PCSOs who noticed that uh, Stephen Sorton uh, was, was missing a trainer. He told them that it had come off uh, while he was running. The PCSOs, obviously, who, who were aware of these gang members and they were well known in the area, told them to be on their way and went off in the direction that they'd come from. Sorton and Cunliffe were arrested within hours of being stopped by the PCSO. Adam Swellings had returned home, but detectives weren't far behind. We dispatched a team to his home addressing crew to arrest him once we established that he was involved in the offence. Adam Swellings, I'm from the Cheshire Constabulary. Do you know why we're here? Yeah, I've been watching news, Anna. You come with us, please? His reply was something along the lines, I've been watching it on the TV, uh, but he gave uh, the impression to the officers that he, he didn't really... he wasn't really bothered about what had taken place in fairness. With Swellings, Sorton and Cunliffe now in police custody, Detectives began the process of uncovering more about their prime suspects. How I would sum up their interviews, though, they, 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 it was a total disregard for um, any evidence that was given by any other person, total disregard for the fact that Mr Newlove had unfortunately died, and their interviews were about lying to save their own skins or to try to. Adam Swellings was somebody who had been involved in theft, in robbery, he'd been involved in criminal damage, 
He was somebody who was known when drunk to cause really serious trouble, somebody who went looking for fights, was an instigator. Can you tell me what you were doing on August the 10th at 10.30 in the evening? In the first interview, Swellings was quite dismissive of his involvement, but uh, subsequently in the second interview, he did try to minimise his involvement by saying that he was involved with just one punch that landed on Mr Newlove when he fell to the floor and then he didn't partake in, in the attack any further. Stephen Sorton had a fairly normal background by all accounts and it, it couldn't be said that he hadn't you know, had the opportunities to, to go down a different path. He didn't come from a family that you could say w was lacking in, in moral guidance. I think he was just a, a, a young man who couldn't really be kept on the, the straight and narrow. But he was someone, again, who took a very active role in the offences committed by the gang and was known to have quite a vindictive edge. Sort of never admitted anything during the, the interview um, other than that he did find out there'd been an attack in the street and he said he went to investigate and render assistance while he was waiting for the ambulance and that's how he lost his shoe. However, the eyewitness accounts were that he rendered blows to Mr Newlove by kicking him and his shoe came off in that attack. And in, in the subsequent trial at court, then, then that evidence was given by his co-accused as well. But Sorton did make an admission to his mother after he'd been charged that he'd been involved in the attack. Jordan Cunliffe wasn't as physically imposing as Adam Swellings or Stephen Sorton. He was a, a smaller, weaker character uh, on, on appearance, but he was somebody who seemed to have a real edge to him. He was very cocky. He often invited the other members of the gang to, to come round to his house where they'd gather to drink, where they'd gather to do drugs, because he was left to his own devices for, for long periods. And, and I think this was something that characterised the gang members as, as a whole. They had no conscience at all. That their parents didn't often know where they were, didn't keep tracks on them once they went out in the evening of an evening, and certainly didn't ask questions about what they'd been doing and, and, and where they'd been and, and what they'd been up to. Well, you can help yourself. Jordan Cunliffe denied his involvement. In fact, he even denied being in, in the particular area, but said he walked up the street some time afterwards. Well, the eyewitness accounts put, put him in company with the gang at the time, and obviously the eyewitness accounts of, of the PCSO who stopped him some short while later of being in the presence of Sorton. It wasn't me. It was you. There was some CCTV in the area that was on one of the dwellings, which quite clearly shows that he was in with the gang when Mr Newlove approached them, although the, the attack was off camera. But he, his, his account was that it, five or so minutes later, he walked up the road and, and, and saw the aftermath and then just carried on. However, we obviously carefully looked at that CCTV evidence and there was no sign of him walking up afterwards. The fact, the evidence was that he walked up with the rest of the gang and then was challenged by Mr Newlove. The trial was held at Chester Crown Court, which is one of the most historic Crown Courts in the country. It's famously where Myra Hindley was put on trial, a very large, grand courtroom. And that did add to the sense of importance of the trial when you're sitting in during proceedings. The case began in mid-November. 2007. In the dock, charged with the murder of Mr Newlove, was Adam Swellings, the ringleader of the gang, Stephen Sorton, who was a couple of years younger, Jordan Cunliffe, who was 15 at the time, and then two other youngsters, a 17-year-old and a 15-year-old boy, both of whom can't be named for legal reasons. Those were the five who the police and the Crown Prosecution Service uh, put before the court. I was confident that, that we had sufficient evidence to convict all the youths involved in of Gary's murder. And at the start of the trial, Swellings actually did offer a, a plea of manslaughter, which we discussed with our prosecution team and dismissed that because we believed that we had substantial evidence to convict him of murder. He's admitting his involvement by saying he, he, he rendered the first blow. The eyewitness accounts put him more involved in the, in, the, uh, uh, in the attack than he actually said. In relation to Stephen Sorton, we had a key piece of evidence. Obviously, his shoe was left at the scene. 
and he also made some admissions to other youths that he'd been involved in the attack. So again, I was quite happy that we had significant evidence against Stephen Sorton, and bear in mind he's also made admission to his mother when he was charged. Jordan Cunliffe still denies to this day being involved in the offence, but we do have forensic evidence of him having blood from Zoe Newlove on his jacket when he said he wasn't there. We had him on CCTV evidence walking past the scene with the group when he denied being involved. And he also made some admissions with Sorton to the peers in the area that he'd been involved in the attack. Along with mounting forensic evidence and eyewitness testimony against the defendants, Gary Newlove's daughters were also called to appear before the court. Following Monday, Amy, Zoe and Danielle were being called to give evidence. And no matter how painful it was for me, I was going to make damn sure I'm there to help my children. They'd never been, never seen a, you know, been in trouble in their lives, never been in a courtroom. I couldn't give them the hug. Afterwards, I was accused of coaching. I could not go near them. And Zoe was the first one to be called. And she had screens round her. And I'm so glad because what happens is they take the defendants down into the cells while Zoe was called in. And then Zoe's brought in and they're taken back up into the dock. They thought it was quite good fun. Whereas I felt physically sick. She wouldn't see anybody. All she would see is the QCs and the judge. I felt so powerless to help Zoe. And to hear what she saw and what she did. They're not only there to do evidence, they're grieving the dad and they're trying to do the best they can for the dad. I saw dad surrounded by six or seven teenagers laughing and, and swearing. <laughs> She's got more guts in her finger than they were in the dock. One of them hit him on the side of the face, another one from behind. And then they, they all just started punching him. And then he was curled up, trying to cover his head with his hand. And then they were just, they were kicking his head like a football. I can remember her telling the court that she saw her father being kicked like a football, which was something that when it was said in court, you know, made, made everybody sort of reel back. Zoe tried to get the gang away from her father and actually got caught up in the commotion and, and during that got blood on her coat. Her boyfriend at the time also gave evidence, and gave quite a harrowing depiction of how at one point when Mr. Noodle was on his knees, one of the gang just aimed a really big punt at him and kicked him, which put him right down to the ground and, and then the attack continued. The gang rained down some 30 to 40 punches and kicks on a defenceless man, on a man who was curled up, trying to protect himself. And then once it was clear that he was offering no resistance, they, they ran off into the night uh, and left him to die. It was very, very vivid and very emotionally um, disturbing evidence. It was just a, a normal guy who was in his house, just standing up for himself, standing up for his family, and paying the ultimate price for that. When it came to Gary's youngest daughter, Amy, to give her evidence, because of her age, the court decided she could do so by video link. Her name's Amy Newell. And Amy was told not to fidget, sit on your hands, don't show any emotion if you're going to cry. It was an ordinary Friday night. This is a 13-year-old. Never been in a courtroom in her life, looking down a monitor to a person she's never seen. And to me, that's not fair. They were children. So while we protect the defendants in the dark, who protects the children, witnesses? The family are asked not to show any emotion, um, so as not to prejudice the jury. Um, so that was a very difficult one for Helen and the family, um, whereas the defendants were laughing and joking. So when my dad went out, that's where it all started, really. My mum shouted at my dad. One of the defendants was in the box and was allowed to have his mum with him because he was upset. Yet when the girls were given their evidence, they weren't afforded that luxury. As the court heard days of shocking evidence, everyone present was appalled by the behaviour of the defendants in the dock. During the actual trial, when, when the evidence was being given, 
Helen Ulof was there every day. I think it was clear to see how devastated she was and, and, and the effect this had had on her. At the same time, the youths involved in the case didn't seem to have any respect for the proceedings. No real sense of the magnitude of the case and of, of what they'd done and the fact that the eyes of the country were on them at that time. They were laughing and joking and making a mockery, really, of proceedings, in particular Jordan Cunliffe, who, who, who laughed and joked his way from beginning to end. Helen and the rest of the family were extremely upset, purely because they'd been laughing and joking um, and were disrespectful. It's just unbelievable. You've got the defendants that gold you. They're looking, they're yawning, they're laughing. On occasions, I think I did even actually see one or two dropping off to sleep while evidence was being given. They thought it was a bit of a joke, making sneering remarks when other people were giving evidence about their involvement on the night. Disrespect for the criminal justice system and certainly disrespect for Gary Newlove and, and Helen and the girls, really, in the fact that they made the girls give evidence about watching their father being attacked, which I thought was quite shocking, really, that they knew their involvement, yet they made young girls who had just previously 10 weeks seeing the father kicked to death stand in the witness box and give evidence about what they saw. Nobody stopped them. The judge didn't ask them to sit up, stop yawning. One of the most shocking revelations in the court was that Adam Swellings, the self-styled leader of the gang, had been released on bail the very morning of the attack. He was up in court for an attack the week before. He appeared before magistrates, and magistrates had the opportunity to remand him in custody. But they decided not to. They decided to release him on bail. He was told to stay out of Warrington and to leave Warrington immediately and go back to his home of crew. But the first thing he did was head back towards Padgate, towards Fernhead, to meet up with his friends and to go out and buy some alcohol start drinking and get up to his old antics. I remember them saying he'd been on bail. So not only he breached one lot of bail, he'd gone and breached the second lot of bail that he'd been given. And the fact that he was awaiting sentencing made me feel, why are we bothering? Members of the jury, have you reached a verdict? We have, Your Honour. When the jury finally delivered their verdict in the trial, it was another hammer blow for the New Love family. With the technology we've got for media, my girls knew before I could actually get to the phone to tell them, and they were so angry they couldn't understand what, what why. Um, and I just burst into tears. In January 2008, the trial of the gang of youths alleged to have murdered Gary Newlove was drawing to a close. The court had heard weeks of traumatic evidence, but finally the jury had arrived at a decision. Members of the jury, have you reached a verdict? We have, Your Honour. When finally the jury said they were able to come back and they were ready to deliver their verdict. There was a real tension. Everybody in the room did seem to be on, on the edge of their seat. There was such a, sort of a nervous energy, both in the press box and, and, and looking around the room. The, the defendants, who, who some of them had been quite boisterous and, and cocky during the trial, were, were quiet. They were still. You could tell they were anxious. And when the verdicts were delivered, when Swellings was found guilty of murder. He was emotionless. When Sorton was found guilty, he just gazed straight ahead, didn't give any reaction, didn't show any emotion. But the one that was most surprising was uh, Jordan Cunliffe, who laughed and joked in court. As it dawned on him that he was spending the rest of his youth in prison, as it dawned on him that he'd been found guilty of murder, he just burst into tears. <laughs> and I could only describe it as a howl or a wail. He wailed out in court. Adam Swellings, Stephen Sorton, and Jordan Cunliffe were found guilty of Gary Newlove's murder. The other two defendants were acquitted when two people were acquitted and three were convicted, what do you say? 
And when people hear you say that, they think you want you know, retribution, you want revenge, and I don't. Most victims' families, and myself included in that, you speak to them, they just want to be able to sleep at night, close their eyes, and know they've done the best they possibly can, and hope that the system that we have in this country does the best that it does. But unfortunately, victims are not at the heart of the justice. We're at the bottom ladder. Adam Swellings was sentenced to life and ordered to serve a minimum of 17 years in jail. Jordan Cunliffe received life with a minimum tariff of 12 years. Stephen Sorton was sentenced to life with a minimum of 15 years. His sentence was reduced to 13 years on appeal. Swellings and Cunliffe also appealed their convictions, but they were turned down. For me, life means life. It doesn't mean a minimum tariff. It means life. And it's a mandatory life sentence for murder. And if you don't really say what you say on the tin, what does it have an impact to stop kids going off and doing these things, or anybody going off and doing these things? And that's, that's where there's no justice. And I just say, well, come and sit in my shoes, because girls and I and the rest of the family are serving the life sentence. As the killers began their sentences, Gary's wife, Helen, and the girls faced up to life without him. Everybody says, does it, you know, does it get easier? How do you cope? Um, how do you do it? And I don't think anybody can answer that. We can, we just get up. I remember them seeing me in bed and they thought mum was giving up and I can't do that to them because if mum doesn't get out of bed, they're scared, they've only got mum left. Helen made the brave decision to use the tragic loss of her husband as a way to highlight the issues affecting our communities. I just thought I can only try and do something to make Gary not a murder victim, see him for when people hear and speak about him as a person, and actually look at society, how desensitised we've become for actions that well, years and years ago we'd be horrified. You know, how many people walk past people now who've been attacked in the street? How many drunks do we see in the street? We're not bothered about it. In 2010, Helen was invited to become a peer in the House of Lords, acting on behalf of victims and communities. I, Helen, Baroness Newlove, do swear by Almighty God that I will be faithful and bear true allegiance to Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth. When I went for the induction day, I did feel very much, you know, a bit like Coronation Street, Hilda Ogden. What am I doing here? Somebody's going to tell me you've come in the wrong door. But it, it's, uh, it's, you know, I'm two years down the line and I feel, still feel very honoured and humbled and it's such a warm place and I'm so proud to be here. Her work takes her across the country, meeting local people who are tackling antisocial behaviour. I'd gone round so many areas, spoke to offenders, gone to Hindley Prison, youth offending, so I was really, really keen to roll my sleeves up and get stuck in. She also spends time visiting schools, making children aware of the dangers associated with alcohol abuse. The message is, do it safely, do it responsibly, and you'll have a happy time. I have been in schools where, you know, I have had a young child, age nine, asking how many units are in a glass of whiskey, which I really couldn't contemplate, A, him knowing whiskey at that age, but also units. The fact is that this isn't a story. But I think it's really important to go into schools to tell you know, they say a story, and ours it's not a story, it's my life. But to get that message over to them. Helen New Love's campaigning, coupled with the efforts of the Cheshire Constabulary's neighbourhood policing teams, have dramatically improved the situation in Warrington. Nevertheless, Helen's tireless work continues, benefiting communities across the country, whilst also representing a fitting legacy for Gary. This was so shocking because every member of the public across the land could probably put themselves um, in Gary's shoes, having gone out and, you know, told some kids off for damaging a car. Um, but I think the most shocking side of it has got to be the fact that Gary's children witnessed, um, you know, him being brutally attacked. I do what I do because I, I really can't get my head round he's gone. I can't get my head round he had cancer and he didn't die from cancer, he died from kicks to the head. And I think I do for I do because 
I don't want to live in this society that accepts that kind of crime and we can't do anything to speak up for as a victim's family. And that's the bit what I do do, is that I'm not in it for anything else, no hidden agenda. If I can make somebody else not go through the pain, that's all I want to do. You know, I'm just gonna carry on making changes for this because um, I always said that Gary would never be a statistic. Nobody should be a statistic. Um, they're human beings, they were somebody. We love somebody. But I'm hoping he'd be really proud of the fact that I will never let anybody forget who he was because he didn't deserve that.